Welcome to the Gong Objection Handling Masterclass program. Today we're going to talk about how you can master the art and science of handling objections step by step so you can get past no more often and close more deals. So objection handling is one of the top sales skills that separates good reps from great reps. It's one of the top sales skills. And the reason is even if you spend a lot of time and great technique in doing objection prevention, you are still invariably going to get numerous objections during any successful deal. And if you're not equipped with techniques and rebuttals to handle those, uh, those objections successfully, many deals that you could have closed are going to be lost. So the way I think about a sales process and closing a deal is it's like embarking on a sea voyage. Okay, it's like going on a sea voyage. Objections are like little ocean storms that happen on the way during your sea voyage from point A to point B. Now that means a couple things. It means either you're going to get shipwrecked in the case where you're not well prepared to handle objections, or it could be the most fun, exciting time during the sales process because you're a seasoned sailor, sailor who knows how to handle these types of situations. So today we're going to talk about a few different types of objections. We're going to walk through a step-by-step -step framework for handling objections and how that framework changes for each type of objection that comes up. And the way I see it, there are really five types of objections that are surfaced or in a typical B2B deal. And this is the sales objection spectrum. Over on the left, you have easy objections such as smoke screens. And over on the right, you have really hard objections that really are not even objections, they're just major problems such as conditions and complacency. And we are going to address each one of these. We're going to talk about what each one is toward the end of this and how you should custom tailor your objection handling methods to each one of these types of objections. So first we're going to get into the framework that's going to apply to all of those types of objections. It is a six or seven step framework and we're going to go through it step by step. And step one, no matter what type of objection you receive, whether it's a smoke screen or a true objection or whatever the case is, your immediate response is to clarify with questions. Now, based on our data here at Gong through the analysis of over 3 million recorded sales conversations, we found that superstar salespeople the top 10 and 20% in the performance runs more often respond to objections with a question of their own. Average performers and unsuccessful performers do that less often. And the reason this is an important mode of response is because objections, objection scenarios are rife with misunderstanding. And if you don't clarify the underlying cause or what's really going on, you may be addressing the wrong thing. Now here's what most salespeople do instead of respond with questions. The objection gets the seller all riled up, it triggers maybe some insecurity, and they pounce on the objection. They go on what we like to call a knee-jerk monologue, where the customer voices what is probably a valid concern, and the sales rep spends the next 30 or 60 seconds steamrolling. And what this does, aside from probably makes you address the wrong concern because you didn't clarify it, is it reeks of insecurity. If you go on a long sprint of talking after what the customer believes to be a valid concern, it triggers red flags in their brain. So here are a few tips. Here are a few types of questions that you can ask when you receive an objection. So this is a picture of a guy named Chris Voss who wrote a book, Never Split the Difference, which I highly recommend everybody read. 
And he has a technique that he calls it mirroring. And it is where you repeat the buyer's final few words of the objection that they just voiced with an upward inflection that gets them to elaborate on the objection. So for example, if a buyer has a pricing objection and they say, your price is just too high, you simply respond with, the price is too high. And then you pause and you let them do the job of further explaining. Now, the key is you have to pause. If you mirror the buyer with an upward tone and you don't pause, then the buyer is not going to fill that void. You have to almost uncomfortably pause, count to three seconds, and let the, the buyer voice further concerns. Now, even though this first step is about clarifying the objection with questions, one question you want to avoid in this scenario is asking the word or asking the question, why? And that is because that is not a clarifying question. That is a question that, quote unquote, questions the validity of the buyer's objection. It feels threatening and it triggers your buyer to go into a defensive mode. So instead of asking why, you can replace any why question with the word, what's causing that? And this is a great question that is going to apply to many of the objections that you'll receive during your sales processes. Can you help me understand what's causing that concern? Of course, you can mix and match the words here to tailor to the situation, but this is a great objection clarifier to keep in your back pocket as a gut level response. To further illustrate the principle, objection handling is like peeling an onion. The core of the onion is the thing you really want to address. That's what's truly on the buyer's mind that if you did address it successfully, you would move past it and get a yes in your sale. But usually objections are surface level. They're the outer layers of the onion. And the only way to peel back the onion is to probe and to question and to clarify until you get to the true essential core of the objection. So think of objection handling like peeling an onion. Okay, so that leads us to step number two in the method. Step one was clarify with questions. Let them clarify for you. Let the buyer uh, voice the objection in more detail. The next step is to validate their concern. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. Humans go through 95% of their lives feeling misunderstood. Okay? They feel misunderstood. Most of the time, they are denied the gift of feeling understood. If you, as a seller, are the person who shows that you understand them, they'll be blown away. In fact, as a quick side note, ensuring that your buyer feels understood is so important to sales success that the solution selling nine block discovery methodology, which is what we're looking at here, dedicates three out of its nine types of discovery questions to what the author calls it, summarizing confirmation questions, which is another way of making sure your buyer feels understood. Now, if you get this principle right, for many of your buyers, it might be the first time in their lives that they felt truly understood by another human being. That's how rare it is. Now, a great phrase to keep in your back pocket to validate your buyer's concern is what we're looking at here. That's a valid concern. It seems like you're, and then fill in the blank with what you're observing them express in terms of emotions. For example, this might sound like, you know, that's a really valid concern. It seems like you're torn on what to do. And then you pause and you let them further explain. And if you get this right, this is empathy on steroids your buyer will likely never have felt more understood in their entire life. Okay. Now, this leads us to step number three, which is isolate the objection. Step one was clarify with a question. Step two was validate the concern. Now we are going to isolate the objection to ensure that you're addressing a true objection and the right objection. 
Now, it's important to isolate the objection because it might be a smokescreen. They might be saying what the objection is. They might be saying one thing but feeling another. And so you have to make sure you're going to be addressing something that you can sink your teeth into. And here is your back of the pocket question you can ask. After you've gone through the first two steps, your next move is to say this. If we somehow figured out how to solve that issue completely, what other obstacles would we have to overcome before moving forward? Now, if they start voicing other obstacles, chances are that those other obstacles are more important objections for you to address. Not always, but that is going to be the case much of the time. If they don't have any other obstacles, then the initial objection they voiced is the true objection that you want to address and you've successfully isolated the objection. That was a very simple step. Most of these are simple. What is going to be hard is putting them all together. Uh, it's not gonna be hard if you go through this course one or two times to make sure you get it right. Each of these seem very simple in isolation. When they're put together, magic can happen. And that leads us to step number four, which is gain permission to overcome the objection. Your goal here is to neutralize your buyer's mind. Make them receptive to a new way of thinking. Now, without this critical step, you will trigger resistance. You can execute every step we've done before this and every step we'll do after this. But if you leave this out, your objection handling efforts will fall short because your buyer will resist. Now, when I tell people you should gain permission, you, sh you should essentially ask your buyer uh, for permission to quote unquote overcome their objection, what I see a lot of salespeople asking is, can I make a suggestion? That is their line for gaining permission. And this question actually does not work. This question triggers defensiveness. Even though it seems like it follows the principle of gaining permission, it triggers defensiveness. The buyer may act like it, but they will, be emotion they will not be emotionally receptive to whatever suggestion follows this question. It triggers what I call the rebellious teenager effect. Can I make a suggestion triggers this effect. The buyer feels like they're being lectured to, they sit there pretending to listen, nodding their heads and smiling, but ultimately they are not on the same page with you mentally or emotionally. Now, the phrase that you wanna keep in your back pocket that's going to work like a charm in today's selling environment is, can I bounce a few thoughts off of you? This question gains permission and neutralizes the buyer's mind successfully. It's significantly less threatening to the point where it's not threatening at all. And what happens when you ask that is this is a bit of a, this is a bit of an exaggeration, obviously but the buyer is now emotionally receptive to whatever suggestion or objection handling technique you're about to make, as long as the following technique is not abrasive or threatening. Okay, step number five is address the objection. So now that we've executed the first four steps, it's time to figure out what kind of objection we're dealing with and what kind of response each type of objection requires. So let's get into the first one, which is smoke screens. This is all the way to the left on the easy to hard spectrum. And the reason I say this is easy is because the smoke screen itself is easy to address and to get rid of. What is behind the smoke screen is not so easy. So your technique for overcoming a smoke screen objection is isolation. We've already covered this. Your job is to simply get to the onion. It's to peel the onion and find the real objection. And your phrase, again, just to repeat, is if we somehow figured out how to solve that completely, what other obstacles would you have to overcome before moving forward? That is how you get past smokescreen objections. The true objection will then surface after you've asked this question. Okay, so objection type number two on the spectrum is what we call concerns. So a concern is an emotional hurdle that a buyer has when they are already sold on whatever idea or product or proposal you're making. 
and they just have a few final concerns that you need to figure out. And these are incredibly easy to overcome in terms of complexity, but sometimes it can be hard to arrange the execution of this. And here's an example. The customer is concerned about a lengthy implementation process. You're about to close a software deal, they're concerned about a lengthy implementation process. Your solution is simply to give them what they need to hear or see to move forward. And in this case, it would be to introduce them to a reference customer who had a very smooth and short implementation process. Now notice that's easy to do, or it's easy to remember, it's an easy technique. It might be a little more difficult arranging that reference customer. Another example, the customer is concerned about product usage. They want to use your software or they want to use the solution, but they don't want to buy another piece of shelfware. They're just concerned and you just need to qualm their fears about having shelfware. Well, the solution there would be to show them believable proof that your customers achieve insane adoption rates with your product. So your objection handling technique for concerns is essentially telling them what they need to hear or showing them what they need to see to resolve an emotional hurdle before moving forward with what you're suggesting, whether it's the sale or a next meeting or something else. Okay, this leads us to the middle of the spectrum, which is true objections. This is where the most finesse and objection handling skill is required. These are your true objections. Now, true objections are best overcome through what we call a reframe. Now, what is a reframe? It is an insight that flips how your customer is thinking about the objection. It helps them see th things through a new angle that changes their underlying belief about the objection. So here's an example. Now first keep in mind that this example would not work by itself without the previous steps we've covered where we cl clarify with questions, validate concerns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Without the context of those, this looks like an argument. But with the context, and after we've gained permission to offer our reframe, it will change the way your buyer thinks. So this is an example of an objection we get here at Gong when we want to start pilots uh, with a sales team. And the objection we hear is, I don't want to start a pilot until after next month. We're too busy closing out the quarter. Right now is the worst time for us to do this. Now, we simply take that idea and we reframe it. We reframe it from bad timing to the timing could not be better. And here's what we say after we've gone through the previous few steps. The conversations your team will be having before end of quarter will be higher stakes, okay? These are the deals that are gonna close. And it's more important for you to capture and get visibility into those conversations so you know what's happening. I would argue right now is the best time to do a pilot, especially since it's so easy. Now you've taken essentially the root of the objection and you've uprooted it. So here's a few questions for you to think about in terms of coming up with your own reframes. Think about a predictable common objection you get during your sales process or your sales team receives. Is that objection a problem that can be reframed as an opportunity? Is it a weakness that can be reframed as a strength? Is it poor timing that can be reframed as perfect timing? Put your objections through those three questions and you're gonna come up with some very creative objection handling rebuttals and reframes. Okay, objection technique number four, which is conditions. So these are not objections in the true sense of the word. These are problems that need to be solved and many of them are potentially disqualifying problems. So an example would be, you don't have an in integration the buyer's needs. You can't overcome that condi condition with an objection handling technique. You have to solve the problem by getting your engineering team to build the integration or come up with some sort of creative solution. Another example, they don't have the immediate cash. Now, this isn't a too expensive thing. This is a different situation. They do not have the cash on hand 
to pay for your solution. You cannot overcome that with even the strongest ROI argument. You need to solve the cause of that problem with some sort of creative solution, such as an innovative payment schedule. So the point of conditions is to recognize them as separate from objections and that the solution is to dream up a creative solution to the problem rather than a slick phrase or objection handling technique. Now the final type of quote unquote objection, and it is on the furthest part of the spectrum on the hard spectrum or the easy to hard spectrum is complacency. And this is not an objection, this is a selling problem. This is when your buyer is just not sold on the idea of buying your solution or buying it now or buying it from you. It is something that needs to be addressed early in the sales process through either qualification or urgency building sales techniques. The point you should take away from this is if your buyer feels complacent, then objection handling is not the solution for you. The solution is to rewind the sales process, press the reset button, and figure out how you can build a sense of urgency or gracefully bow out of the deal, recognizing that it is not a qualified opportunity. Now, I'm not gonna spend too much time on how to build urgency. We have other courses for that, and we will have other courses for that. But a quick point is urgency is about building pain, not selling benefits. So if you think about any sales narrative, you are telling a story about helping your get buyer get from point A to point B. Most sales pitches focus on point B, the benefits, the outcomes, the results you want to help your buyer achieve. But that is not what creates urgency. What creates urgency is building the pain and perceived unsustainability of point A. Only after you've done that will point B resonate. So this is a little bit of just kind of a reminder slide. It's a bit redundant, but the secret sauce of urgency inducing sales messaging is to tear apart the status quo, tear apart point A before you introduce point B. Step number six out of seven is to confirm an unbiased resolution. Unbiased resolution. Make sure you're not leading the buyer to confirm that the objection is resolved with a leading question, which could leave the objection unresolved, which will landmine your deal later on. Now, here's how you do this. You've gone through the previous five steps, you've reframed the objection, and it seems like you've figured it out and overcome the objection. Your next line is to say, what part of your concern do you feel is still left unaddressed? Now, you wanna phrase this this way. The phrasing matters. You don't wanna say, does that overcome your concern or does that solve your concern? Because that leads them to say yes. Now, if the buyer is truly unresolved, then the phrasing of this question is going to air that out. This is the best question for achieving an unbiased resolution. And if they say, you know what, nope, uh, everything is addressed, we can move on, then you've successfully overcome your objection. If you haven't, then you're going to know about it. The buyer's gonna say something like, well, actually there's this one part that I'm still a little bit worried about. And now you have something to sink your teeth into that is not going to landmine your deal later on in the sales process. Without, a, without resolving your objections in this way, deals often go dark. Okay, that's like sales slang for deals stall out without the buyer really getting back to you as to why or what happened. So this is a deal gone dark killer. And finally, that leads us to step seven in the objection handling framework, which is attempt to surface others. The last thing you say in your objection handling process, once you've overcome the objection and resolved it unbiasedly, is what other reservations do you have right now? Since your buyer is kind of put in the mood to voice their concerns, if they have other potentially deal-killing concerns, this is a great time to get those out so that you can address them head on. Now, if they answer no other concern concerns right now, now you can march your sales process on successfully. But if they do have other concerns, 
Now you go back to step one and you clarify with it, clarify the objection with a question and you go through the seven step process and overcome that objection as well. Okay, so that leads us to the summary. So just to summarize everything, and I'm actually gonna give you a quick uh, example of what this would sound like so you have something concrete. Uh, let's say I'm selling Gong and I'm dealing with the pilot objection we discussed earlier. The, I'm trying to push my buyer to do a pilot before the end of the month, and she says, you know what, I wanna do a pilot, but before the end of the month does not make sense because we are trying to close out our quarter and we're extremely busy. The first thing I'm gonna do is clarify with questions. It's not the right time, and I'm gonna pause. They're gonna say, yeah, you know, we, some of our most valuable deals are on the line right now, so I don't have time to run a new project and implement something that's going to have you know, long-term payoffs but potentially distract us from closing out the quarter. Now I'm gonna to go to step two, which is validate their concern. That's a completely valid concern. It seems like you want to make sure you have the best quarter possible. I'm gonna pause and they're going to voice further. Yeah, of course, that's kind of my job. Now your job is to isolate the objection. Now, if we truly overcame that concern, if we waited even until the end of the quarter, what else would prevent us from starting a pilot? The buyer responds, nothing else, that's the big thing, we just need to close out the quarter. Now that I've isolated the objection and I know I'm dealing with the true objection, I'm going to gain permission to overcome it. Do you mind if I bounce a few thoughts off of you? Sure. Now I'm going to address the objection with a reframe. You're trying to close out the quarter and it, it's important to you that you do that. And you are currently perceiving gone as something that is going to distract you from closing out the quarter. Now, I would argue Gong is going to help you close out the quarter incredibly more powerfully, and here's why. The conversations your reps are having are deal closing conversations. They are high stakes, they're probably negotiating. And if you're not capturing those conversations to make sure they're on a strong path to close, you're probably going to lose a few deals before the end of the quarter. I would argue right now is actually the best time. It is like a gold mine of opportunity to do a pilot, especially since it's so easy. Now I'm gonna let them respond and see if what I just said landed because it may not have. Now if it did, I'm going to confirm an unbiased resolution and I'm going to say, what part of your concern do you, still, do you feel is left unaddressed? And they're going to say something like, you know what, no, you're actually right, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's get something going now. And at that point, I probably don't have to attempt to surface other objections, but I might try it anyway and say, what other reservations do you have right now to starting a pilot? So that is what the process looks like. Uh, I hope you liked what you learned here today. Listen to it a couple times. It'll really make everything stick. And be sure to check out a live demo of Gong by going to gong.io slash demo.